people. Now he's very dangerous. Only just fired a shot there. So many people had been through horror. There is the fence now. It's just absolutely crazy dangerous. It's very easy to focus a lot of attention on the drug cartels and the crime syndicates that run not just Mexico, but all of South and Central America. What we wanted to see was the actual movement of the people themselves. It's quite a humanitarian crisis. So all these people running away from their own countries because they don't have money or the gangs are threatening them. The people smuggling is an absolutely out of control, unregulated business worth millions. They'll smuggle anything, whether it be guns, drugs, or migrants, or they'll do them all at the same time. We wanted to be with migrants as they were making their journey through Mexico and up into the United States. Many of those people have to come through Guatemala. So we needed to start our trip in Guatemala, but we also needed to get to the crime gangs who move drugs and people in exactly the same way. Guatemala is a sort of entry point to Mexico. It's especially very dangerous as it gets towards the border, where the crime gangs are really, really violent. No matter how confident you feel in the local people you work with, there's always this nagging doubt that you are going into the unknown, you are dealing with some pretty dangerous people. They are cartel. Your kind of safety really is in, in the hands of the gangs. So they know they've got to get to a location that we're not being told about. OK. What could possibly go wrong here? Let me make this done. Okay. Let's not tempt fate. No. We knew other cartels were operating down there, and we definitely didn't want to attract their attention, because these are not only people smuggling routes, but they're also drug smuggling routes. We arrived to a predetermined location. Yeah, they are just coming there. <coughs> but we, are, we have time. OK, how long have we got? Within minutes, a sort of slightly bedraggled group of people walked out of the mist and the darkness. What struck me straight away is that there were some really young girls in that group. This is the beginning of the journey for these people. They're going, well, thousands of miles. Most of them try to get to the United States, so they have to use uh, the traffickers who will get them there, but it's going to cost them money. Arriesgando nuestras vidas porque yo sé que es algo peligroso, pero y vamos a, a llegar y para poder ayudar a nuestros padres porque ellos han luchado para sacarnos adelante y ahora nosotros también queremos. The system guarantees they get to Mexico and much further on, and in fact, for some of them, they believe that they're being smuggled all the way through to cities in the United States. They're paying quite a lot of money to what is called a coyote. This is a person who oversees the group. Is it safer for everyone to travel together in a group like this? Van pagando todo para que no les hagan daño. Porque si no se reportan o si viajan solos sin coyote, los secuestran y los matan rapidito. The route is a completely illegal smuggling route. There's no danger from officialdom. Your danger is always from gangs. There was these two young girls. One of them was 16 and one of them was 14. They knew they were on a dangerous trip. I just don't think they realized how dangerous that trip could be. The truth is, for many girls, they can be raped and can be forced into sex slavery. And that was just heartbreaking. It really was. It was their naivety, I think. That was what was so worrying and upsetting, really. <laughs> It was very touching, actually, really poignant moment. It was just a few minutes before we crossed into Mexico. I've got a little girl myself, and it just broke my heart just to think that she was so full of hope and enthusiasm for her future, but at the same time, I knew what was likely to happen to her. 
Yeah, well, this has been quite a, a trip through the mountains. And literally just around the corner from here, uh, we're going to enter Mexico. It hurt to say goodbye to them. It really did. Um... They will then keep moving on and moving on, going from one set of gangsters to another set of gangsters, all the way up to the American border. If you could have actually just picked them up and put them in the United States or given them enough money to go home, you would. But you can't. If you've crossed over from Guatemala, you're going to go to Tapachula. If you have vulnerable people on the move, then you will almost guarantee that they'll be preyed upon by crime gangs, and with crime gangs, it's usually the sex industry. You could see prostitutes on the street, and some of these girls were young. I mean, they were really young. That made the team feel concerned for the welfare of the young girls who we'd just met. This girl we met, she's now a professional prostitute. That's what she does, but she didn't start life like that. This girl had crossed the Guatemala border with a coyote. She was effectively sold and was never allowed out and worked as a, a prostitute to pay the debt for five months. Her debt was $100. Uh, it was quite staggering. Los agarraron entre todos, los violaron, se puede decir, porque pues no era pues nuestro gusto. I think that perhaps that's the saddest bit, that guilt that she felt she was responsible for what happened to her. And I think anyone who's ever done stories like this knows that is such a standard thing that happens for women who have been abused all over the world. How have you survived? Sometimes she works on the streets and sometimes she's in this brothel. And that, unfortunately, brought home to us what the outcome of this journey is for many of these young girls that got to everybody it really did choke everyone up there is a global network of gangs all facilitating the passage of migrants from wherever they come from in the world through central america and up into the usa it's like a cargo town, except the cargoes are humans. And we actually found people from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. Certainly nothing we expected to see in Mexico. Their tales and exactly where they have come from are actually mind-boggling. Two guys we spoke to in particular who were from India told us how they had been robbed and beaten all the way along there journey there and the boys talked very much about the 10 day walk that they had to do through the jungle in Panama. Mafia has a weapon like gun, sword, they kill if man not uh, survive in the jungle. If you fell behind, if you injured yourself or you became ill, they just shot you dead and left you in the jungle. So this just sounds about the worst thing you could ever have imagined on earth. You can see the, the dead bodies lying there everywhere, have smell of dead bodies. The most amazing thing for me is that they think that they were lucky. You know, they say, but I'm lucky because I am still alive. There are a number of crossing points into the United States that are proper big crossing points, and one is Nogales. It's literally been split down the middle by the U.S. border wall. And so you've got Nogales on the U.S. side, which is in Arizona, and then you've got Nogales on the Mexican side. We saw this one family who were standing, having a conversation through this fence. They were physically unable to be together. Our experience there was to try and meet up with the gangs that would actually facilitate the movement of people across the US border. Now we're on our way to a meeting with one of the drug gangs which also deals in people. They're a Sinaloa cartel affiliated gang. The killing of journalists in Mexico is very common but the killing of foreign journalists is very rare. But you are dealing with gangs. Where I'm greeted by a masked man with an AK-47 in his hat. And the guy with the Kalashnikov 
never left our side, and yet he had his eyes on us the whole time. You can move marijuana, you can move cocaine, but also you can move people as well. You live in Guatemala, right? Mm -hmm. You send me people to here, mm -hmm. so you call me, let me know. And is crossing very easy? Not very easy. Okay. Right now it's very dangerous, you know? You have to pay the mafia to cross the people to that state. Clearly this meeting had been about checking us out. Because ultimately we wanted to get to the border to see the, the people who were being smuggled illegally. Although they are a gang, they're actually the safest way to get across the border. Without them, you've got no protection whatsoever. One of the things of dealing with criminals in my experience, that I have a few, some experience dealing with criminals, normally they keep the word. They don't have timetable. There was, as is usual with these things, a bit of waiting around. It was on, it was off, it was on, it was off. I started to have my doubts, actually, about whether they were serious or whether they had changed their minds. Then all of a sudden, Ulysses got the call. Go on then, what's happening? Uh, we can go, film, start walking. If we want to see the jump, it's going to be at, the, at that, uh, night time. I'm very loath to be going a full four hours and fall back in pitch darkness. I was quite worried about the team. So, you know, who's coming to get you in the middle of the night, in the middle of a desert, in a place that you're not supposed to be, with a load of cartel members? No, just something about it I don't like. I'll meet you downstairs in a few minutes. It's been going on and off now for, um, for what feels like forever. I think we will definitely have no choice but to go out and see the gang who are meant to be moving these migrants. But I'll have to make a decision on whether I think it's possible to get to the border and whether it's too dangerous to do it. They were very adamant that it had to be a very small group, and so really Richie and I have to go with Ulysses as a translator. This is the road where in a few minutes, probably 2015, they will pick us up. Now we're on the road where we're meant to meet the smuggling gang and some of the people who want to cross the border into the United States uh, tonight. I'm not sure how much we'll be able to see or how far we'll get. We drove out into the middle of nowhere. Why do we spend all our time in, on shitty roads? Going to meet dodgy people. <laughs> oh, man. Is this them coming back? <laughs> this is the last bit of the journey by car. Very shortly, we're going to be dropped off and we're going to begin uh, the walk. We can't show any faces. There's two of the guys here who are going to be going across the border into the United States. Um, we have people with us who are going to show us the way and then we'll obviously uh, come back. We were driven even further out into the countryside to a drop-off point. It takes some planning, but is it quite easy getting over? We met Coyote, the guy who was going to take one migrant across. And we met the migrant who looked very nervous indeed. It was costing him 5,000 US dollars. The family had stumped together to get the money. And so the start of a new life. He wanted to go over there and get some work and he could change their lives. Their way of doing it is to know which bit of the border has not got border patrol. And they use that by having spotters. Okay, we're getting near the border now. That's why we've gone into a uh, night shot. It's getting very dark out here. And they're very, very jumpy. They keep checking, seeing if people are coming, people of anyone around. And it's not so much actually the authorities, but more other gangs, because everyone uses these routes. And they can be very, very dangerous as a result of that, because they start fighting amongst themselves. But they're very keen to keep going. And then suddenly we come through this clearing and there it is. There's the border between the United States and Mexico. There is, there is the fence now. The guy's telling us to be quiet. Keep going and we need to go back. Okay. Okay. Is it their gun, man? Yeah. It's probably people around you. We should go. There are heat sensors on the... A fence which is just there, which why they won't let us go any near, but the guys have disappeared and now there's other people we think coming, so we've got to get out of here. The guys themselves were very nervous and very jumpy. They were not hanging around. Yeah. Yeah. 
We've just walked back from the border. It was actually scarier coming out than was going in. Now we'll wait for a car to come and pick us up. We actually got to the border, the guys have got over. What I think this shows is just really, with a bit of organization, how easy it is for people to get across that border. And it's something that uh, the United States government and the Mexican government have not discussed. Often the border is there. You can't stop people crossing it. Jim Chilson is an old-style rancher. This is the international boundary. Mexico, United States, my ranch. You see it's just a four-strand barbed wire cattle fence. He has about 22 miles of fence that is the border between Mexico and the United States. He's an 80-year-old man, and he showed us surveillance video. It clearly shows large groups of cartel members, drug mules, coming through his land. Every day, he is confronted by Mexican drug cartels. They are quite literally on Jim's doorstep. And he's been putting up with this for years. We had a border patrolman almost killed on our ranch. It's like the Wild West. It is the Wild West. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he took us on this big, long drive down to his land. We're off like a herd of turtles. I mean, you realize how vast his land is. There's undoubtedly somebody up there on that mountain right now. The Mexican side of the border is being used by cartel scouts. So the scouts live up on this mountain. Do you think there'll be uh, cartel members out there watching us now? They know where we are right now. They're watching us. Everybody ought to wave. So the scouts direct the operations of the drug cartel and the people being smuggled over. And I was just filming, and I could hear some voices. I, mean, I knew the team were over there, but the voices were coming from over there. And on this hilltop, just over the Mexican side of this fence, I started seeing some movement. The cartel scouts. You can see them much better in your viewfinder. Yeah, you can see them really clearly here. Yeah, we must be three, four hundred meters away. We're well inside the rifle range. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I was like, I can actually see them up there. And then Craig got the drone up and tried to film their position. I tell you there. I'm not gonna like that, are they? No. I've got one of them coming out from under the trees. Perfect. We could see them moving around quite clearly. And I had seen a long weapon which looked like an AK, so we knew that they were armed. We need to spot a shot there. Yeah, I know. Warning shot. I didn't hear anything whistle by. I did. Nothing. No, I didn't whistle by, yeah. but it was definitely a shot. We had a shot. We don't think they were shooting at us, but probably telling us to go away. Yeah, they're shouting now as well. And then there were a few more shots, and then we started to hear voices. I suddenly spotted two of them walking down the hill. Where's Richie? Because there's some guys walking down this path right now. Yeah, I've got them. And coming down the hill, are two blokes from the hideout. You're shouting amigo. Yeah. Sounds friendly enough, but um sounds friendly enough. <laughs> then I said, well I'm gonna go over and see if we can talk to them. Stuart's going over there. We got a chat to Rich. Hold on a minute, mate. Don't go over there on your own. That is one of those moments that could go either way. It could have gone very, very badly indeed. I was wondering how dangerous are these guys going to be? could be very dangerous, but on the balance of probabilities, right, like Jim's armed, right? He's a rancher, he's got pistols and rifles with him. And it was quite clear quite quickly that they were actually shouting for something. How are you? No money. No smoke. And started talking to them in their balaclavas on the other side, say they were there for sort of three months living on the hill. You work for the cartel? Sinaloa. Their job was to look down at what's happening on Jim's farm while Jim is standing next to us. <laughs> and many people come through? Eleven uh -huh. people. None of us really spoke any Spanish. They didn't really speak any English. Thank you. Ah. 
Not serious? There we were, standing on either side of this little barbed wire fence, having a chit chat. That doesn't happen every day. <laughs> I mean, this is sort of the crazy thing that we're we're divided by a piece of uh, barbed wire, right? Yeah. And a <laughs> and some railway track. It was an interesting moment and, and really quite a poignant one that the two two are there together. You know, which one's the victim here? You know, <laughs> you just don't know. It's like. Is Jim the victim because they're coming across, or are they the victims because they're so poor they don't got any water and they're living on a mountain? It's very easy to cast everyone involved in this pretty awful trade as really, really evil. It's not as clear-cut as you would like to think. Everybody along the line, apart from a fortunate few, are all desperate, and that includes the drug smugglers and the people smugglers. They've all grown up in these terrible places and they're all making a living the best way they know how. All these people we saw on this trip were just trying to make their lives better in some kind of way. I know that it's illegal, the stuff that they are doing, but they are just escaping from violence and trying to find a job and a decent way of life. The authorities have no way at this stage of stopping them and people prepared to take a risk that most of us would never even consider.